when it when you look at the volume of transactions being done by 22 year olds these days, there's not a home investors franchise in the nation. I was with a kid named Sean last week in Atlanta that does 300 deals a year. Now, are they like home investors deals? No. Are they as profitable? Probably not. But it's 300 deals a year. There's people out there that are doing 500, 600 wholesale transactions a year right now. So I'm not, if I had to rank home investors of America in the quantity of acquisitions, I don't think they have a single franchisee that would be in the top 30% of transactions in the, in the nation. No. Welcome to the Franchise Hot Seat Podcast, where we talk about all things franchising. Now, here's your host, Dr. John P. Hayes. My guest is Tim Harridge, longtime friend, franchisee of Homevestors, right about the time that I was the CEO of Homevestors. And lots of people are asking me and probably asking Tim, what happened to Homevestors? We were the 800-pound gorilla back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, right through, right up to the Great Recession when things went haywire. So, Tim, you got involved with Ken D'Angelo before you were a franchisee. You were buying for a franchisee. So you knew him personally. And when we talk about what happened to Homevestors, well, the first thing that comes to my mind, even though I succeeded him at his request, the first thing that happened was we lost Ken D'Angelo. Right. Was there ever a, a greater personality character in uh, franchise real estate uh, or the, the Texas area than Ken D'Angelo? No, I mean, you know, John, Ken was my first example of a leader after I got out of the Marine Corps, right? So obviously that's, but that's an entirely different kind of leader, right? Yeah. Uh, and I just remember Ken, when we would do well at the franchise, I worked for Bobby Roan, as you know, he would pick up the phone and call me. Yeah. And at that time there had to be 400 me's in the nation, yeah. just the guys that were running appointments for the franchisees. But we were always the top buyer, like at least every other month. And every time Ken would pick up the phone and call the office and get me on the phone, Jerry would transfer him if I was out and 45 second conversation, you know, congratulations, way to go. You and Bobby keep kicking tail and he'd hang up the phone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that spirit, man, I mean, just resounded throughout the entire franchise network. Yeah. So it's not only in real estate, it, it, it's the value of a leader, of a charismatic personality like a Ken D'Angelo, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. Yeah. But what was it about that? that uh, and, and whether you're in real estate or not, doesn't matter. Whether you're in franchising or not, doesn't matter. Leadership, how important is that? And you being a Marine, you're right there. You understand it. You know, here we are 20 years later, and I've been fortunate to run some really big companies for Blackstone and some other large family offices. Um, and you see a lot of people slap core values on the wall. Uh, you hear a lot, you see a lot of people get a mission statement and a vision statement. And all it ever is, is to make themselves feel good in the boardroom or yeah. to have something cool to put on their wall in the lobby. Uh, I, I don't, there's certain people in this, in, in business that you can tell they mean what they say they're about. Like they're about it. Yeah. And that was the thing about Ken is like, you always got the, the, the feel. And now of course I've heard the stories that's folklore at this point that the, the man never came up upon a problem that he thought was insurmountable. And the man never let anything negative get in the way of him being there for his people and his team. Uh, and and uh, I, I've met some other leaders like that, but in the franchise space, yeah. I, I mean, there's just, that guy's the bellwether to me. Yeah, absolutely. And Ken was the kind of guy when I met him 2000, he had already had 
sold maybe about 50 franchises at that time for home investors. We buy ugly houses. And he didn't know what a mission was. He didn't really care. If, if he needed a mission statement, John, write me a mission statement. He, he, he had values, but he didn't need to put them on the wall to have values. But if we thought we should have a code of values, because he would always measure himself by the Dwyer group down in Waco, which is now known as Neighborly, one of the biggest of franchise conglomerates. And I worked with the Dwyers very closely. Ken knew that. So he'd say, what are the Dwyer? How do the Dwyers do that? So Ken wasn't a guy who, who was manipulative at all or who uh, just followed suit. He knew that um, from his heart, this is the way he was. So when you got a call from him, you loved that. He was larger than life, truly the best kind of uh, franchisor uh, anyone could uh, have because it came from his heart. He would do anything uh, for you. And, and we don't always find that in my many years of experience in franchising. That's not always the case. There's a lot of lip service, but Ken didn't give the lip service. So well, I'm not even... Go ahead. I think also one of the things that impressed me about Ken is he wouldn't oversaturate. And I, and I, I don't just mean a market. Yeah. I mean, like, the, the, he didn't give out a bunch of awards. It, it was... Everything was intentional and purposeful. Therefore, it was important. And it I didn't know him personally like you did. So it sounds like since it was from the heart, that's why it came out that way. Yeah. If he gave you an award, like it was because he thought you deserved an award, not because we needed an extra one hour award ceremony on right. the stage. Exactly. Yeah, that was Ken. Well, and in franchising, quite unusual what he did. So he came up uh, through the real estate ranks in Dallas. Uh, he was a, a, a broker, um, always putting up with uh, agents, complaining about this or that. One, one day he fired them all because they were all complaining. But when he found a, a home in Dallas that he couldn't buy because he was embarrassed to show it, it was just in bad condition. But a sweet old lady lived there and she kept calling him and saying, please buy my house. I need to move. And it again, it was all heart. Ken was all heart. Got to his heart and he, he didn't know what he was going to do with this house, but he bought it and then he fixed it up, turned it into the, the nicest looking home in the neighborhood and sold it uh, for a market value and did it in a very short period of time and realized I had more fun doing that. And that lady thinks I walk on water. The lady who he bought it from, who he gave a fair price to her for the house. She, she just loved him. And he said, I've never felt this good in real estate until this experience. And that was the beginning of We Buy Ugly Houses. First, it was We Buy Houses, which he put on billboards, which nobody had ever done before. The billboard company said to him, you, you, you can't put your phone number on a billboard. And he said, well, I'm paying for it. Can I or can I? Do you want my business or not? We buy houses, telephone number. But that led to a lot of people calling with uh, $800,000 properties. That's not what he wanted to buy. He wanted to buy, as you know, the starter home. Three bedroom, two baths. It was a $100,000 investment uh, in Dallas. So he decides to uh, put up the billboards. The phone rings, gets the wrong calls. It occurs to him, we buy ugly houses. Again, the billboard people went crazy. You can't do that. That's insulting. People say they have an ugly house, but not to Ken. He never called the house ugly and people knew immediately what he was talking about. And when I left the company in 2009, those billboards were generating 250,000 leads a year for home investors, franchisees of which we had about 265 when I left the company. How important was that? How important was the lead generation at Homevestors? Well, it was huge. I mean, it, it, it specifically, I hate to date us, John, but, but pre-internet, yeah. right? <laughs> when I couldn't get a cookie on your computer and chase you around for seven weeks, yeah. um, it was the only way. It was localized and it was specific. Yeah. And you've never had better leads than I would say pre-2008 Homevestors billboards. 
I mean, those billboards, my gosh, when you got the 844 buyer phone number on the, on the caller ID, right. You knew someone had an ugly house. They had already identified. Right. I have an ugly house. Right. I, I want to sell it. I'll call those people. And, and like you said, you never have to call their house ugly at that point. No. At that point, they're going to probably apologize for the thing the whole time. And you can tell them, Oh, this isn't as bad as I've seen. Yeah. Uh, so that, that lead gen, but more importantly, the genius in it was it was a pre-qualified, pre-screened, self-identified lead. Yeah. So it wasn't a prospect. It wasn't even a lead. If you go into the sales methodology, it was actually an opportunity. Yeah. Like we skipped the prospect and the lead phase and it went straight to opportunity. Yeah. You never beat those leads. No. And people would call and say, I, I'm not sure you'll buy my house because it's so ugly. <laughs> they really yeah. set you up as a franchisee or a buyer to go out there and grab that house. Well, and then Ken's genius was to take and put the smaller billboards in the local neighborhoods, kind of like on the, the, the if you're not from Dallas, where yeah. we all started, you know, there's these two and four lane streets that kind of go off suburban paths. And so we would buy those billboards. And the beautiful thing was they would call and tell you like, Hey, I just saw this billboard at Gross Road and I 80 and my house is down the street. So yeah. I liked how it, it gave you a localized, like you said, we could avoid the $800,000 house, house neighborhoods yeah. really be targeted. And so when, when those phones rang, I mean, I, it was different cool. times I've thought about going back just to get those phone calls. Yeah. So. Leads. I mean, we, we sold so many franchises and at first Ken was only selling a franchise for $25,000 franchise fee. And then you uh, had to have something like $5,000 a month minimum to support the, the billboard campaign. Some people well, there's a big net worth requirement back there back then too. Yeah. And then we went to uh, all the way up to a $50,000 franchise fee. Ken thought, wow, that's a lot of money. It, it wasn't easy to move Ken again. Ken led with his heart. So many people don't lead or understand how to do that or think that's bad form. But the other thing Ken did that attracted people, and, and there, was no, there was no other opportunity at the time. If you wanted to be a real estate investor, you needed leads. And Homevestors was the answer to those leads, those We Buy Ugly Houses billboards. But you also needed money. Maybe you had a little bit money to go out and, and get a couple houses and turn them into rentals or flip them if you wanted to do that. Ken was not big on flipping. Uh, so you needed a lender. You needed hard money or, or, or soft money. And where were you going to get that? Well, once again, Prospect Avenue. Ken and his friends put together a little bit of money and they would loan that money. Uh, later, when I became the uh, CEO, uh, actually before, right at about the time of Ken's death, uh, we we had bank money. We had a $50 million line that we turned three and a half times a year. And, and yes, we made money off that money. Of course we did, but it was also a fair deal. How important was the lending that, Fran that Homevestors provided? You know, John, I I'll tell you this. What you guys did at, uh, it was called uh, Homevestors Investments, I think, right before yeah. 08. You were so far ahead of your time. I mean, if that, if that Great Recession didn't hit the way it did, yeah. that arm of the company would have turned into a multi-billion dollar company. Absolutely. I mean, I mean I'm in that business now. You mm -hmm. know, I'll do $120 million in loans this month. You know, we'll do $1.6 billion this year. And so money is key. The only thing common, and there's two things common in every real estate transaction. And that is you got to have a property and you got to have the money to buy it. It's right. just, <laughs> after that, you can figure it out, but you got to have a property and, the, and, and someone's got to pay for it. Yeah. So that mon the money piece. And then you guys, right before you put together the wealth builder program, which was a way to, take from the uh, bridge money, the hard money, yeah. and then immediately flip it over into uh, the long-term rental loan. And that's something, frankly, that still has not been duplicated in the lending space. Hmm. And I try, I try hmm. and I try and I try. And it's just, uh, that product was revolutionary. And it's just unfortunate that, I don't know, uh, 
everyone went bankrupt in 08. Yeah. Well, we had uh, leads and we had lending. And I think that was the magic formula. And we, and we had know-how. We had knowledge. We had uh, people like you, uh, expert buyers. We had them all over the, the country. We had people also with big hearts and people who understood the business. And we provided decent training um, as well. So, And no one ever chased us. We never had a second brand on our heels. If you were going to be a real estate investor, you had one choice. It was home investors. Things started to change a bit. There were others out there organizing under different names, but they were pretty much tacking signs on telephone poles, which our franchisees were not allowed to do. You right. couldn't have a bandit sign. Ken was also very strict about those kinds of things. You violated our rules and regulations, and he shut you down. There was a, an incident in Ohio where a franchisee didn't even know that his buyer was violating our rules and regulations. And Ken took that franchise away because he never wanted to uh, tempt the media to write a series of articles that would be negative about what Homevestors and We Buy Ugly Houses was doing. And that never occurred. We didn't have a lawsuit against uh, Homevestors uh, all through Ken's life, never a lawsuit filed by a franchisee or anyone. Uh, against homevestors. Of course, they came later, uh, but it, it, it was still unheard of to have at the time of Ken's death about 225 franchisees and not a lawsuit in a business like uh, real estate. Unheard of. And again, it goes back to Ken's heart and the good things that Ken did and understanding what real estate investors uh, needed. Well, uh, along comes the Great Recession, and we were flat footed. Even though we had real estate experts on the board, and I was not one of them, I was a franchise guy. That's why Ken asked me to succeed him when I said to him on his deathbed, I don't know anything about real estate. Yeah, I was a franchisee, but I had a partner doing that. Uh, and I traveled with Ken for uh, several years out to franchise markets, speaking with them, talking with them, him demonstrating when they would say, I just can't buy a house in St. Petersburg. Well, you set up some buy appointments and uh, pick me up Tuesday at the airport, and I'll show you how to buy houses in St. Petersburg. And he would do it. It was just, and he wasn't doing anything that he that he didn't teach others how to do as well. Bobby Roan, you, and uh, other terrific franchisees uh, along the way. But the that Great Recession, we had loaned so much money to so many franchisees, uh, they start defaulting on their notes. Well, we defaulted on our note and in franchising, as well as business period, when you have a bank relationship, we couldn't sell franchises anymore. We were pretty much dead in the water until we sold the business to a guy who I had written a book with, unfortunately, now deceased. His business just sold for $9 billion, co-founder of Subway, Fred DeLuca, who had been an investor with us. I had written his book, Start Small, Finish Big. We'd known each other for a long time. He was interested in, he wasn't in real estate himself, but he saw a play for his money in uh, Homevestors. His idea was, uh, it's too expensive, John. You got to have $50,000 for the franchise fee. Uh, you've got to have money for uh, billboards. You've got to have some net worth. You need to dumb this down so that, Anybody could become a Homevestors franchisee, even if they want to do it part time. So teachers, this would be a great opportunity for them or someone who wanted to keep a job, but do this part time. That was against all of my principles and it was against Ken's. Ken would have never gone uh, that route. And, and I think maybe and I want to ask you about this, because once I left the company, I sold it in 2008 to DeLuca. I left in 2009 when DeLuca cleaned house and my contract was not renewed and there was just a core group of people uh, left there. Uh, I, I disengaged from Homevestors it, and, and I moved to Kuwait a year later to, to teach uh, franchising and marketing and moved on with my career. That's what I'd always planned to do when I could afford to go back to a university and get a professor's salary again, I was going back and that, that scenario occurred. I did not like, and, and you were at a meeting where we introduced, I think it was the first time I met you, and you had just become officially a franchisee. 
and I it, meeting was not in Dallas. It was someplace else. And we were talking about this associate franchise that you could put on your credit card. And I thought that's the kiss of death. Well, I, I wasn't right about that because they went on. I think Homevestors has more than a thousand franchisees today. But w- was that the right move at that time? And I would argue it was the kiss of death. I mean, honestly, since they really started doing that, and I don't think they started selling associate franchises till 2010 or so. Yeah. Look at the meteoric rise in property value. I mean, a moron could have made money for the last 10 years. And a lot mm-hmm. of them did. Uh, I I got to go back and correct you a little bit. You said that we had decent training. And I thought we had great training, but it wasn't fancy training. Right. It was real world. I will teach you to buy houses. And John, do you remember how long training was before you left? Yeah, it was, uh, it was originally five days when I met Ken in 2000. He asked me to revamp it and we moved it to seven days, including a weekend. We were trying to figure out how to let people go home and come back for a couple of days. And then I believe we moved it to 10 days when I left the company. Uh, it was a full two weeks. Yeah. Do you know how long training is now? No. Three days. Oh, my goodness. Pitiful. It's it's We had great training. It wasn't fancy. Now, you when you left, we had just built the new uh, academy upstairs, and that was cool. Uh and, and I don't know, you don't remember this, but I was actually one of the first people in the world to find out what had just happened to you the day that you got shot in the back because we were having a big investor meeting at the corporate office and yeah. you came in wearing like civilian attire, yeah, which was far out of character right. for Dr. John yeah. Hayes. Right, exactly. And, and I went to the back room. I said, "What? Ha- what's, what's up? And you were like, I'm not going to be seeing a lot of you anymore. And I was like, yeah. Holy crap, it's happening. Right. Uh, so anyway, I go all the way back to, so you said we didn't have great, de- we had decent training, but I thought we had world-class training because it was focused on what it took to be successful, not what it took to make money, right? Uh, and then also I go back to some of this conversation has to do with one of Ken's earliest partners, Ernie Hughes, Yeah, who is still, I think he's still yeah, training. He's still out there, yeah, great guy. One of the things Ernie used to say that was one of Ken's monikers was it's a numbers game in a people business. Mm -hmm. And I feel like up until 2009 or even 10, it was still a people business at Homevestors. Mm -hmm. And then it became about making money. It became about pushing units. It became about growing franchise count. It became about more fee revenue and there's just no heart in that. It mm-hmm. it's it's it became a money grab that made money off of people. And all of the best franchisees ever, in my opinion, there's some of them that are still in the system, but most have left, including the family members of Ken D'Angelo. Yeah. Uh, who are great friends of mine. I have no doubt we would all still be in the system if we hadn't oversaturated it, if we hadn't discounted it, and if we hadn't made it a carnival. That's the best thing I can say. It was a carnival, John. It, wow. it became push them in, ramp them up, get their ad spin, grow, 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 grow. Lawsuits, fine. Let's manage that percent. Look, I'm in the private equity world, right? I know the math. It became about math because once DeLuca ended up owning the company, as we, I'm not sure if I can say this, as we all know, he wanted to exit it. He never wanted to own it. No. (laughs) And so if you, and then his family office got involved. And at that point, smart people do what smart people do to exit companies. Mm -hmm. And so you got a company that didn't change hands for over 10 years. And now in 10 years has changed hands three and a half times. Yeah. Uh, And, it, it, it's they're just cleaning house again, but they're cleaning house and replacing with Ivy League MBAs that they're only there to make a profit. They're not there to help people when the company was founded to help people. Yeah. So I feel like 
it used to be a numbers game in a people business. And now it's a numbers game in a growth business. And I feel like that's where the company lost its heart. I think you're exactly right. Uh, and today in franchising, unfortunately, it's a numbers and a growth business too often, particularly when private equity gets involved and the heart has left the business. And in many of these private equity cases, uh, like Dwyer, for example, the Dwyer family remained involved. There's still, uh, he's not Mike Bidwell, who leads neighborly, not a Dwyer, but next to uh, being a Dwyer because he came up through the ranks as a franchisee. So the values, the print, let's just call it the heart of a Ken D'Angelo is still at neighborly. And definitely they put their emphasis on numbers and growing that business, but they've never lost the heart that is so important in running any kind of a business, but particularly a franchise business where you have hundreds of franchisees who depend on you, who love getting a call from a Ken D'Angelo saying, Good for you, Tim. Keep keep doing what you're doing. That probably didn't happen at Homevestors after I left. And I had learned that from Ken, the importance of the relationship. And I knew from working with DeLuca, writing a book with him, knowing him for many years prior to that, understanding some of his other uh, business investments, this was a money play for him. And thank God he did it. Otherwise, we would have gone bankrupt. Right. We, we were there. But he came in and saved the day with his money, but always with the intention is I need to flip this as quickly as I can. I don't want to be in this business. Too complicated for him, too costly for him. It took him a while uh, to get out of it. but uh, and, and I don't know that that really helped uh, because uh, you know, it went from uh, one frying pan to another frying pan in a sense. And the leadership after I left, and I'm, this this. This was after Ken left, and I was just there to hold it together until we could find another Ken. We didn't expect that recession coming along, uh, but they never found a Ken. I don't think they ever knew that was important. The leadership consisted of some guys who who took direction, uh, were never going to speak up. They were not franchise guys. Uh, they, they had some franchise experience, but they were not going to stand up to DeLuca uh, and his people. And that that must have been obvious to franchisees right from the beginning. You know, when you left, obviously they don't publish an article to tell all of us exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. But what I know is one person remained on top and the other person disappeared. And had they not brought that person back, there would not have been a Homevestors anymore. Yeah. Because he was the... And I'm talking about Ken Chanel. Yeah, yeah. He was the closest thing to a heart remaining at the company after yeah. open heart surgery. Yeah. And the day they put him out to pasture the second time, yeah. you knew the company was over. Yeah. And not over financially. Right. I just mean over from the place people raved about to becoming the place. I mean, Thousands of investors a year, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. There's so many conferences now that are bigger than the Home Investors Convention. It's not funny. Yeah, amazing. And one of the most bitter, angry groups are the ex home the, the ex Home Investors franchisees yeah. because they feel like they were taken for a ride, milked of their money in an upside down system, and nobody gave a dang. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sad, sad ending for for a company founded by one of the, the the most dynamic personalities I've ever met in my life, not just in franchising, but period. Ken was just a great friend to everyone who particularly who became part of his uh, company. Well, and, I'll tell you and, another thing, John, ahead, that yeah. you don't even know, probably. You remember Rick Morgan, right? Yes. ResCap. Earlier in this interview, we talked about you needed leads and money to make deals happen. Yeah. Well, when DeLuca stepped in, remember, he shut off all the lending. Mm -hmm. He said, we're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. And if not for Rick Morgan, Homevestors wouldn't have been able to offer money at that time. Well, earlier this year, Rick Morgan was put out to pasture by the new ownership. Wow. The man that... Lit literally built the current finance system inside the co company that 
helped develop the technology that integrated with the financing. I mean, Rick's a hard pill to swallow. I love the guy. But when I found out that they told him to get lost, I mean, you're it, that that was just amazing to me. Yeah. When did you leave as a franchisee and why did you leave? So I left in 09, uh, the first time, <laughs> uh, because I mean, we were out of money and we weren't even really out of money. We were out of energy. Oh, eight and 09 was like getting up every morning and being in a boxing match all day. Yeah. Um, uh, funny aside, Fred Burley, who was another part of the heart of Homevestors well, from the beginning. Yeah. He called me, and I get goosebumps when I tell the story. He called me in 07 before the crash, and he's like, hey, I got this bank that wants to meet with you. And that's just the kind of people that ran Homevestors. Mm-hmm. A random executive board member right. calls a random franchisee and is introducing me to a bank. Yeah. And I told Mr. Burley, I said, I'm good. I have enough banks. And he goes, this is one of my, I, I tell this quote from stage monthly. Yeah. He goes, boy, you never know when a bank's going to tell you to go to hell. You yeah. need to go meet with Lane. And for those of you listening that are not from Texas, you know, when your elder talks to you that way, the only thing you say is yes, sir. Yeah. Well, fast forward to April of 08, when all my lines of credit got called due, there was one bank that would still loan to me and it was Jefferson. So I tell that story all the time because I mean, that man saved my financial life. I mean, right. Jennifer and I were able to, we went from number one in the nation, flipped 143 houses in 07. I've got pictures on the stage with you that I love. It reminds yeah. me of like my first rise to just, yeah. uh, and it also reminds me of all the mistakes I made. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, 08, 09, uh, my God, Jennifer had to become a full-time realtor selling foreclosures. I was a stay-at-home dad. At night, whenever Jennifer didn't have to work, I'd go work on our rental properties and we'd owner finance them just to get out of them. It was awful. Um, but, oh, and during that time, we had a kid and my wife had cancer. So uh, yeah. it was about May of 09, we called Bonnie to pass at the corporate office. And I just said, I'm done. Uh, and I, we had a like six months left on our contract. And they were like, we understand. Thank you for all you've done for us. You know, good luck. Yeah. Uh, and then in 2012, after I started the REI Expo, Ken and David came to me and gave me my franchise back and made me a development agent. Oh, okay. Because I had... Ken, the, Ken, or Ken Chanel did that. Ken Chanel, uh, yeah. yeah. Because I had the big expo with this massive audience. Yeah. And they wanted me to be a part of it. And at the time, with the, the way it was intended, I thought it would work. I really did. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it became really clear that the royalty fees and the advertising cost and the lack of uh, financial ability of the people we were allowing in the system uh, uh, wasn't going to work out. So I exited the second time. Uh, in December of 2016, when I sold my franchise and my DA business. And that DA business was uh, brought over from Subway. That's how DeLuca built, and it worked in Subway. Um, the wealthiest people in the Subway network are the, the development agents. And he wanted that same thing to work in Homevestors. Why didn't it? Why, why, why could it not work? So in real estate investing, right, the market drives what you can pay for the house. Mm -hmm. And if you're factoring in four or five percent in fees and cost, you're at a disadvantage when you walk in the door. In our system, the system Ken designed was all ready for us to be the lowest offer. I mean, it was always it was you make the offer that, you know, your family's okay and that you can perform on. It wasn't get the contract and try to renegotiate. Right. So we were always the, not always the lowest. Most of the time, the home investor's office was the lowest, but you closed 100% of the time. Yeah. I mean, here I am. It taught, I'm so ingrained in that system. I've been doing this over 20 years and I've only not closed on a house I had under contract one time. Uh-huh. And that was when the COVID lockdowns came and I called the agent and said, if you have any other buyers, please sell it to them. I'm scared. Yeah. And she goes, 
will you give us the earnest money? I said, absolutely. Yeah. Because I learned my lesson in 08 and 09, right? Uh-huh. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like it was the, the DA business and it, 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 the model just loaded so many fees onto underqualified and undercapitalized individuals. Mm-hmm. You know, one of Ken Chanel's favorite things in training used to be, be real estate can make a millionaire out of a multimillionaire, right? Like, and, and that's just what it is. When you run a high over, over high overhead inventory business, right? That's reliant upon turning transactions in order to sustain profitability, you're manufacturing, right? And when you're, once you become a manufacturer, right? You just said earlier that Ken D'Angelo was all about rental properties or owner finance. He didn't really care for flipping, right? He, he wanted right. to help people and make money. Right. Uh, once you become a manufacturer, right? It's all about lower your cost per lead, lower your quality, increase this, increase that. Cause you're just trying to get more money to come out the back end. Yeah. So I feel like we definitely, the DA business, it, you brought in too many unqualified people. They, they met the UFOC or FDD acquire, requirements, but uh, they just didn't have enough capital to sustain a real estate investing operation. Yeah. So did you have associate franchisees under you who you realize they're not going to buy houses and sell houses? Well, I actually set mine up different. Uh, Mike Hambright and, and Mark McKellar were my partners on that. Mm-hmm. And so everything that I sold from the stage, so to speak, they supported. Okay. Um, I was never dishonest with anyone. I mean, anyone I thought didn't have the chops on the sales call, I'd be like, look, man, this ain't going to work for you. Right. But uh, I never really dove into their finances or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've never, but I sold, I had 46, I think, offices nationwide when I left. Um, I haven't got any hate mail. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no one's blamed me for anything. So I yeah. feel like we did a good job. Yeah. Uh, were there underqualified people who got in, uh, whether they were financially underqualified or they just, you know, they, they, they were busy running another business. You can't run another business and be a successful Homevestors franchisee. Yeah, I, I would imagine um, no names come to mind. Yeah. But but I would imagine that there were there were definitely people that strung it together on two credit cards to get in. Yeah. Right. And you know, when we got rid of a lot of the the the, the net worth requirements and 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 I don't remember the specifics, but I, I remember it. When we joined the first time, you had to have, be like a, uh, you had to, have, I think I have a quarter million dollars access to cash or credit. Yeah. And I mean, there was a credit score requirement yeah. and the background mm-hmm. check, all that. Yeah. By the time the new, I'd say the third iteration of it happened, it didn't seem like that much diligence was being done. Mm-hmm. So, what is it now? Homevestors, where does it stand in the world of real estate? Uh, well regarded, we were always well regarded. I mean, we, we were the the model for uh, real estate investing. Uh, what happened? Is, is is that gone now? Do you and where does it stand? I now I still have some great friends in the system. Yeah, and as do I, and I still pray for the success of that company. Yeah. Um, but if you ask the average real estate investor in the nation who the top five companies are, it would not be there. Yeah. What a shame. Yeah. The, the old 800 pound gorilla is more like a, uh, a baboon swinging in the trees right now. Makes a lot of noise, does a lot of activity. Um, but, um, uh, I mean, it, I try to try to be nice, right? Uh, <laughs> which you know for me is hard, John. Uh, no, I mean, look when it when you look at the volume of transactions being done by twenty two year olds mm-hmm. these days, there's not a homevestors franchise in the nation. I was with a kid named Sean last week in Atlanta that does three hundred deals a year. Now. Are they like Homevestors deals? No. Are they as profitable? Probably not. But I mean, it's 300 deals a year. There's people out there that 
are doing 500, 600 wholesale transactions a year right now. So I'm not, if I had to rank Home Investors of America in the quantity of acquisitions, I don't think they have a single franchisee that would be in the top 30% of transactions in the, in the nation. Wow. When in fact we led all of that back in the day. So what would Tim Harridge do? They they want to give you uh, home investors. You, you you've made quite a mark, uh, beginning with home investors and then post home investors. So you know this industry better than the majority. So I led a group that tried to buy them. Yeah. Uh, it would be my dream to run that company. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I do is be increased training. Uh, you know, it, it, not make it this loosey goosey show up and get, uh, a lot of, uh, happy go lucky, uh, pats on your back. Right. Uh, the second thing I do is I'd increase financial requirements to come into the system. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, a good friend of mine, Kent Clothier says how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so, if you're going to let someone be part-time, you can expect part-time effort and part-time results. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd pro I can't say I would get rid of the development agent program, but uh, I think it would need to be tightened up. I would immediately institute a cap on franchisees per market period into story. Uh, that oversaturation and dilution of the uh, quality of the franchisees or the opportunity even, I think has led to uh, uh, some problems. Uh, I would offer people a way out if they were struggling mm -hmm. to, to kind of, because, you know, desperate people do desperate things. Yeah. Uh, and we would immediately start lending. Uh, and not lending the way the current ownership is trying to. Uh, I mean, lending the way the customers need to be loaned to. Uh, the way Ken did with Prospect, the way you guys did with Homevestors Investments, right? I mean, you have to enable success and uh, uh, leads and 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 uh, financing, like you said, it's just the core of it, right? Yeah. If you've got deals to finance and you got financing behind you, uh, so I'd bring Rick Morgan back, honestly. Yeah. So how how is it that I think Homevestors has more than a thousand franchisees, but are are they associates? Are they people doing the volume you and Bobby and others were doing? I'm not sure they have uh any body. I mean, Chaz Carrier just broke the two thousand house mark. First one ever in the home investor system. Mm -hmm. uh, he's just an absolute beast. Uh, I think we all knew he would be at 05 whenever we met him. Yeah. Um, honestly, I mean, there's people doing 100 a year, but I mean, nowadays, John, 100 a year is not a lot. Right. It was back uh, then, but not today. And you know, they've got all these requirements to attend the convention. I know that you got to like pay a certain fee, whether you go or not. Uh, and that's just so they can have the biggest stage possible and put on a big show, uh, which I get from a motivational standpoint. I don't know how, I, I don't know if they still, I don't know the inner workings. I've, I haven't read the recent offerings, but, uh, I don't know how they have a thousand people still. I really don't. And I'm not even sure if they do as well. Yeah. I know yeah. that they've lost a lot, but, and, and then in, in closing in on what we've been talking about, uh, whether it's home investors or any other company, how important is the heart of the leader in the success of the business? I mean, it's the old, uh, diagram where it shows boss sitting in the back of the sled pointing at the people pulling it. And it shows leader at the front of the line, pulling the sled. Um, I, I feel like, uh, 
you know, the leader is the heart and soul. And uh, I love money more than, I mean, I, I love money, John. We're, I'm not going to act like I'm some sort of uh, charitable institution. Right. I love to make money. Yeah. Um, but I think any business, if you always keep the customer at the forefront of every decision you make, um, the FedEx promise, right? On time, every time, or it's free. Um, uh, Simon Sinek's uh, Start With Why. Uh, I mean, look at what Apple's done, right? They sell $2,000 phones and we all line up to buy them, right? Because their customers are so happy with them. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like any business that puts profit over people and forgets the people behind the paper in the loan business, um, is is destined to struggle. I won't say fail, right? Because there's a, there's the sharks out there that can make it happen. Uh, but why not have fun and be proud of what you're doing along the way? And that that was Ken D'Angelo, and that was Homevestors uh, until this change occurred that uh, has created the sad situation uh, that it is. There was no no leader prouder than a Ken D'Angelo. And he loved making money and he loved spending money. But number one, he loved taking somebody who didn't know anything about real estate, didn't know how to buy a house or sell a house or fix a house or why they'd put it in a rental portfolio. And he loved changing that person's life and the family's life. And uh, we we lost. It's ten a.m. Uh, it's time to stand up and stretch. Sorry, <laughs> right? <laughs> My Google we, telling me what to do. We lost the heart of Homevestors when we lost Ken. Yeah, and you know, Paul D'Angelo has become a really good friend of mine. Uh, and I've talked to John a lot, D'Angelo. I talked to Tony and Brownie. Uh, I think, you know, and, and if there's any franchise or a franchisee out there that's running a company or you no know, big or small, even if you have to hire the person to be the heart, yeah. like I remember in the Marine Corps, you got your Colonel and your Sergeant Major. The, the Colonel is designed to get the job done. The Sergeant Major is designed to keep the troops. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not saying if it's not your personality, if it's not your skill set, if you're an investment banker by trade and you're just there to crunch the numbers, go get someone that can be the executive vice president of your company, mm -hmm. that can be the cheerleader, that can keep you from making the mistakes that none of us want to make. Yeah. Great advice, particularly for franchise companies. Uh, Tim, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I always admired you and thank you for your service as a Marine. You're a gentleman uh, as well. I, I've enjoyed watching your story and Jennifer's story through the years and uh, think all the world of you. God bless your family. And I know you're going to continue being successful no matter what you do because you have heart. I appreciate it. Well, John, I'm grateful for you. Uh... There's some stories I can tell you of things that you did for me that uh, I'm not going to have recorded. So uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. I, I, you know, and if I've upset anyone out there, I'm sorry. Um, but I believe in Homevestors and what it was, and I wish it could be that again. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the Franchise Hot Sea Podcast with Dr. John P. Hayes. Tune in next time for more conversation around all things franchising.